Toronto, Canada, The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Welcome to the Audio Imaginarium. Come on in, weary stranger, hang your cloak on a peg, grab a stool, and come gather around the fire. There are stories to be told, and you are among friends. Scott Creighton is host of the very popular Alternative Egyptology Forum on AboveTopSecret.com and the author of The Secret Chamber of Osiris and The Giza Prophecy. He has a new book out that really dismantles the official timeline of the construction of the Khufu Pyramid. And he is waiting in the wings on the line from his home in Glasgow uh, to hang out for the hour. And Rosemary Ellen Guiley, paranormal investigator, joins me in hour two of this transmission. Uh, Ian Robertson is here on the other side of the glass. Uh, but no Albert uh, this week, so uh, subsequently no live stream on YouTube. Uh, the live stream returns next week along with our What's in the Box feature and your chance to win some fabulous Conspiracy Show merchandise. Uh, visit uh, the online store at theconspiracyshow.com and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we've set a goal of 10,000 subs by the end of the year, so please help us achieve that. Uh, despite millennia of fame, the origins of the Great Pyramid of Giza are shrouded in mystery. Believed to be the tomb of an Egyptian king, even though no remains have ever been found, its construction date of roughly 2550 BCE is tied to only one piece of evidence, the crudely painted marks within the pyramid's hidden chambers that refer to the fourth dynasty king Khufu discovered in 1837 by Colonel Howard Weiss and his team. Scott Creighton is here to throw all of that evidence into serious question. He's an engineer whose extensive travels have allowed him to explore many of the world's ancient sacred sites. The host of the Alternative Egyptology Forum on AboveTopSecret.com, and his new book is titled The Great Pyramid Hoax. The Conspiracy to Conceal the True History of Ancient Egypt. Scott Creighton, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. How are you? I'm very well, Richard. It's uh, good to talk to you. Likewise. And uh, uh, you're in Glasgow, Scotland. What's it like over there tonight? Um, well, it's very dark at the moment. It's just after, <laughs> it's just after um, 12, 12, um, uh, well, 12 a.m. Uh, yeah, 12 a.m. So it's uh, the wee small hours here, so... Um, it's a bit dark, a wee bit cold, but um, I've got a nice big cup of coffee here, so that should keep me going. Excellent. Well, we appreciate you staying up late and hanging out with us for the next hour. Now, you know, it's not surprising uh, that someone with an engineering background, and you are an engineer, that you would have this opportunity to travel and, and, and visit places like uh, the, the pyramids, the Great Pyramids, the pyramids uh, at Giza. Uh, but I'm wondering how difficult is it for someone, I'm going to say someone on the outside, because the field of Egyptology, it strikes me as being very sort of closed and very cliquish. Uh, uh, there's an established orthodoxy. There is a, a select few that control who gets access to the pyramids, who funds that work and so forth. How difficult was, was it for you to break into that field? Well, um I'm still very much outside of that field to a large extent, um, Richard. Um, basically, I'm running around the, the outskirts of it, finding um, information, gathering information together, piecing it all together to um, build up um, my own narrative, my own view of um, what these structures were all about. A lot of the times, I think, it actually requires someone on the outside of a particular discipline to do this because, you know, it's hard for um, people within the discipline to rock the boat, as it were, um, you know, because they've got their careers to think about. You know, if they rock the boat too much within, you know, the discipline of Egyptology, you know, it can have bad repercussions for their career, and I'm not just saying that. I know that, um, as a matter of fact, I have some Egyptologist friends who have um, told me that, that very thing. You know, so um, it's, it's probably actually, in a sense, easier for someone like myself to do this kind of thing because, you know, the, the, the people inside Egyptology, they really don't want to go there. They've got their, as I said, you know, they've got their careers to think about. If they, you know, 
see anything that's untoward or that's unconventional, goes against the grain. You know, they, they could be, you know, next time they go to get a grant, a research grant, you know, that could, um, you know, you know, be they just don't get it, you know, or if they want to, um, you know, try and get a research permit sure. uh, yeah. Tec- somewhere in Egypt. Entire textbooks you know. would have to be wi- uh, rewritten. And as you say, academic careers would be on the line. We see this in across many fields, yeah. but it really does not augur well for scientific pursuit because what the orthodox Egyptologists are saying is, case closed, uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza, we can affix it to a particular time, historical context, 2550 BCE, the Fourth Dynasty, and we'll get into that. When anyone in the scientific field, and I don't care what area you're talking about, says case closed, that to me sets up red flags because that is contrary to the whole scientific method. Absolutely, absolutely. And as you said, um, Richard, you find this not just in the fields of um, Egyptology, but right across um, the scientific field. You know, they say, you know, they talk about science as if it is, um, you know, the the barometer, you know, for for everything, you know, that is the the gold standard. But, you know, science, you know, it's full of contradictions within itself. You know, take, um, like, the Sphinx, for example. You've got um, orthodox Egyptologists, they say it's about, you know, it's contemporary with the pyramids, about, you know, at Giza, 4,500 years old. Then you have have the likes of Dr. Robert Schock, he's saying it's not, it's not probably about 7,000 years old. And, you know, then they've got these other scientists, and um, these Russian scientists who are saying, well, I actually know the erosion on the Sphinx um, looks as though it's been caused by um, tidal um, energy waves, you know, sea waves, you know, tidal forces on the body of the Sphinx. That's you know, their interpretation of the erosion. But the last time there was a sea covering that part of Egypt was 800,000 years ago. You know, so here you have... (laughs) That's a big problem. That's a big problem. It's a big problem. You know, scientists can't even agree among themselves. Indeed. Scott Creighton is with us, and the book is The Great Pyramid Hoax, The Conspiracy to Conceal the True History of Ancient Egypt. Now, scientists, Egyptologists, uh, protecting their reputation is one thing, but it's right here in the title of your book, The Great Pyramid Hoax, which obviously suggests uh, that there is something far more nefarious here, and we will get into that. But before we we delve into that and why you question the dating of the construction of the the Great Pyramid of Giza, give us, those of us who haven't been fortunate to be to the, the Giza Plateau, give us sort of a, a real quick guided tour of, of the plateau. Okay. Well, at Giza, you have... Um uh, presently, there are nine visible pyramids. There are the three giant pyramids, um, the Pyramid of Khufu, Khafre, and Menkaura. And you ha- beside the, the Pyramid of Khufu, you've got three smaller pyramids. There's actually a very small one there as well, but it's, or used to be there. It's no longer there. It's called, known as a cult pyramid, but we don't really talk about that. You have like three what are called the Queen's Pyramids beside the Great Pyramid of Khufu on the eastern side. The smallest of the three main pyramids at Giza, you have um, another set of three pyramids, or what are called Queen's Pyramids, to the south side of Menkaura's Pyramid. That's the the smallest of the three largest pyramids at Giza. And also on the eastern side of the plateau, you have the Great Sphinx. Um, Now, a lot of the discussion tonight will be about um, the relieving chambers of the Great Pyramid, um, where these... um, this hoax essentially took place. Now, these chambers um, are within the Great Pyramid. Inside the Great Pyramid, you have three chambers. There's one below the Great Pyramid. That's known as the subterranean chamber. Then you have um, about 100 feet or so um, above the, in the, the body of the pyramid. You have the so-called Queen's Chamber. And then above that, about 200 feet up in the pyramid, you have what's known as the King's Chamber. Now, there are small, there's a series of five small chambers above the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. These are known as the Relieving Chambers, and they each have um, a specific name. The first one is known as Davidson's Chamber. Above that, we have Nelson's cha- uh, sorry, Wellington's Chamber, then Nelson's Chamber, then Lady Arbuthnot's Chamber, and finally, the very top chamber 
is known as Campbell's Chamber. And these chambers, uh, or four of them, were discovered in 1837 by Colonel Howard Weiss. The very first one, Davidson's Chamber, was opened about 70 years before Weiss and, was discovered. And they're called relieving chambers because they serve some engineering uh, purpose, right? Well, this is this is a theory, Richard, but it's a bit of a strange theory that, you know, these chambers were placed above the king's chamber to try and deflect um, pressure off the, the roof of the king's chamber. But the strange thing is, that if you look at the queen's chamber, there are no um, relieving chambers above that. You know, um, ah. you just have the... Uh, the gable blocks above, straight above the Queen's Chamber, and there's a lot, and because the Queen's Chamber is lower down in the the body of the pyramid, it's got a lot more weight above it. Right. You know, so it's 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 a contradiction there. You know, this is, <laughs> you know, scientists, engineers can't really figure, well, figure it out. As we will discover, uh, the uh, the Pisa, the Giza pyramid uh, is a uh, it's a puzzle wrapped in a mystery. Uh, dipped in a chocolatey coating. Scott Creighton is with us, and the book is The Great Pyramid Hoax, The Conspiracy to Conceal the History of Ancient Egypt. We're heading into a break, but when we come back, we'll discuss how the uh, the Pyramid at Giza was dated, how it was placed in this historical context, 4th Dynasty of Egypt, around 2550 B.C., about 6,000 years ago, as you say. Uh, and then we'll get into the evidence for why you believe well, why that evidence really collapses under its own weight. And then what is the significance of that? What, is, what does it mean if we can no longer accurately date the Giza Pyramid or the Khufu uh, Pyramid, as it also known, to 2550 BCE? We'll come back. More of my conversation with Scott. Stay with us right here on The Conspiracy Show. Where there's smoke, there's The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. We are back with Scott Creighton. He's an engineer uh, with extensive travels, which have allowed him to explore many of the world's ancient secret sites. And he's also the host of the Alternative Egyptology Forum on AboveTopSecret.com, very, very popular website, and uh, the author of other books, including The Secret Chamber of Osiris and co-author of The Giza Prophecy. He joins us from Scotland. His latest is The Great Pyramid Hoax. Now, um, why or how was the... The um, the date of 2550 BCE affixed to the construction of the Giza pyramid. Okay, Richard. What we have to um, um, remember here is that um, Herodotus, the the Greek historian Herodotus, who lived about uh, two and a half thousand years ago, he mentioned in his writings that the Great Pyramid was. Um, built by um, Cheops, which um, Egyptologists and linguists have been able to later transliterate into the Egyptian form of Khufu. Yeah, that's the confusing part, because a lot of these uh, uh, pharaohs had at least four or five names. That's right, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And not only that, but, you know, you have, um, there's like two Greek names, you know, um, Herodotus calls him... um, uh, Cheops and Manetho calls him Sufis. You know, so there's, there's, there's just all this. But they all mean they all meant uh, Khufu. Yeah, they all meant Khufu. Well, you mentioned Herodotus. <laughs> you all meant, you mentioned Herodotus, and then if he believes the pyramid was constructed in 2550, because he was practically a contemporary. Well, no, um, Herodotus was writing 2,000 years oh, after. Oh, 2,000, I, my apologies, 500 B.C., <laughs> you're right. Okay, so 2,000 yeah, years after. Yeah, 2,500 years ago, yeah, which is 500 B.C., Got it, right. uh, Herodotus was writing. And, you know, Herodotus is known as um, the, the father of history, but some, some people call him the father of lies. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so the, we have to be uh, careful, uh, my wife is, is listening and she's Greek. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose they had, they had fake news even back then, you know. Right. So... <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Nothing you know, has changed. You know, so it's like Herodotus was, but he was writing 2,000 years after um, the pyramid. So we don't really know um, from Herodotus's writings um, exactly what was going on 2,000 years allegedly before his time, right. whether this Khufu was actually just repairing the Great Pyramid because there's some good evidence like from the inventory stellar which tells us Khufu was repairing a lot of... Um, 
you know, monuments and, and structures at Giza. Ah, you know, okay. So the Great Pyramid could very well have been one of those structures that Khufu was actually repairing, Being repaired. not actually building. Ah, but another historian, Josephus, also believed it was built in that time. Um, well, this uh, Josephus is um, uh, he's he's taking he's building basically on the the, the writings of Manetho. Um, you know, so they're all basically kind of um, you know taking. Um, you know, writing from from each other essentially. Right. So it becomes um, a house of cards. One, yeah, that's one, right. One, uh, one lie built whatever. on the other. One lie yeah, built upon just, the other. Yeah, that's right. You know, so um, because Egyptologists were able to, uh, they knew roughly when this guy Khufu lived. It was two thousand five hundred BC, four and a half thousand years ago. So because um, you know they weren't sure. Um, for definite if um, Khufu was the builder of this pyramid. It was, it was more really sort of circumstantial evidence based on the writings of Herodotus and so forth. But then, in 1837, Colonel Weiss opens up these sealed chambers, these hidden sealed chambers within the Great Pyramid that hadn't been opened in four and a half thousand years. Right. Okay? Yeah, he blasted, he blasted in there with dynamite. Imagine someone trying to do that today. Well, it was gunpowder. Ah, yeah, gunpowder. dynamite okay. was invented later, I think. Okay. But it was gunpowder. Yeah, he blasted his way into this structure with um, gunpowder, and um, you know, supposedly found the cartouche of Khufu in these chambers, painted onto the wall with rough red ochre paint. Right. We need to talk the... about uh, hi how hieroglyphics are formed and and what a cartouche is—that oval shape yeah. around the hieroglyphics. So, talk to me about. Or what a cartouche is? Well, a cartouche is um, basically, if you imagine um, a, a bullet cartridge, yeah? That's, it, it's, cartouche is from the French um, cartridge, ah. which is, um, you know, a bullet or shell of a, of a bullet. That's the kind of shape of a, a cartouche. And inside, it's a distinctive shape. And we, the signs, the hieroglyphic signs inside this um, cartouche shape always represent the name of the king. So the cartouche, when you see a cartouche, you know that's a king's name. Almost like okay. a royal seal or a coat of arms. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Exactly that. You know, so when you see the cartouche, you know what you're dealing with. You're dealing with the name of a king. And um, Howard Weiss allegedly found these cartouches inside um, these relieving chambers of the Great Pyramid. Now, let, just, uh, let me just stop you there, because if we go back uh, maybe a decade and a half earlier than than uh, Howard Weiss, because you mentioned the colonel blasted his way into the chamber at uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza in 1837, and it was yeah. only in the 1820s that they kind of figured out how these hieroglyphics worked, period, wasn't it? Yeah, it was um, uh, Champollion, um, the, the uh, French um, um, philologist, um, Jean-Francois Champollion, he um, cracked the hieroglyphic code, um, I think, yeah, about the 1820s, about 15 years before Weiss went to, to Egypt. Um, you know, so you know, we're, we're talking about a, a time that's, you know, it was very early in the understanding of the ancient Egyptian language. But the thing is, um, the cartouche of Khufu um, was actually known before Vice went to Egypt, and that's crucial um, for for this forgery to have taken place. Um, the cartouche had been published w with, you know, the the name um, below the cartouche, Khufu or Sufis, yeah. And so Vice could very well have seen this and known what cartouche to put in these chambers. And and the um, the royal seal, if you will, or the cartouche of 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 the pharaoh Khufu, what what uh, what symbols uh, were involved? Well, there well there are four um, symbols which make up um, well five if you include the cartouche itself. There are four symbols. You have a circle with um, some dashed lines. Um, then you have a, a bird, then a snake or a viper, and then another bird. You know, so um, the circle um, represents K or K H is um, you know like um, C H. Um, as in like um, Loch, you know, we say Loch in right, Scotland, the right. CH. It's actually pronounced as in Loch. So it's actually Khufu as opposed to Khufu. But most people just say Khufu. Um, the bird represents the letter U. The viper or the snake represents F. 
and the other bird is the other you. So that represents Khufu. Okay, so when Colonel uh, Weiss blasts his way into the chamber, finds this cartouche bearing the, the name of Khufu, or Cheops, as the Greeks call him, uh, that was just further corroborating evidence of what Herodotus and Josephus and, and others had said all along, that the Great Pyramid was built by Khufu, Khufu in the 4th Dynasty, around 2550 B.C., case closed. Yeah, because Egyptologists knew when Khufu lived, this cartouche was allegedly found in this sealed chamber. Ergo, you know, by extension, the pyramid was built, you know, 2550 BC, case closed. Right. And further, uh, the belief was that the pyramid uh, was built as a burial, primarily as a burial chamber for the pharaoh, correct? Yeah, that... that um, was the, the, the belief um, in Vice's time and obviously right up until the, until the present day. But even in Vice's time, there were still people questioning, you know, whether they were built as tombs or not or as something else. But, the, you know, there's other narratives which have come down to us which suggest that there weren't tombs, but there were something else altogether. I don't know if we have time to get into that, but, you know, um, there, there were other... Um, you know, stories and legends about what the pyramids are originally built as and the, have come down to us. No remains of, of Pharaoh Khufu were ever found. I mean, these, these tombs would have been raided by tomb raiders long before vice came on the scene. Well, that's the conventional narrative, Richard, that, you know, the, the reason that the mummified body of Khufu or any ancient Egyptian king was never found is because you know, the tomb raiders came along and, um, you know, raided their tombs. But, you know, it's it's a crazy thing indeed, you know, of the king's body. The king's body was the most important thing, the most precious thing. It had to be protected at all costs in ancient Egyptian religion because the king had to commune with the gods to make sure the Nile flooded, the crops grew, etc., etc. So protecting the king's body was paramount to the ancient Egyptian religion. So ask yourself the question, why would they then go and build the most massive advert to where the king's body was, you know, that's ever been built in, in humanity? You know, this, this pyramid is nearly 500 feet tall. You know, it's like an advert to every tomb raider in the land. Here it is, guys. Come and get the booty. Right, right. I mean, has, uh, just a slight side road here, but has, have the remains of any pharaoh, whether we're talking Tutankhamun or Ramses, have any of them ever been located inside a, a king's chamber in a pyramid? No. Never. Tutankhamun um, is the only in situ um, king that has ever been found. But he's, his body was found in the Valley of the Kings in a, a shaft tomb that was buried deep into the mountainside in the Valley of the Kings. It's not in a pyramid. He's the only one that's ever been found, uh, king's body in situ, in its you know, original in situ state, undisturbed state. No bodies of any kings have been found in any of these pyramids. All right. So here it is, your um, uh, theory that this cartouche found stamped inside one of these chambers by Vice, Colonel Vice in 1837, bearing the name of Khufu, was a forgery. Now, yes. others had before you, uh, most notably, of course, Zachariah Sitchin, who's very familiar to people uh, listening to this program, almost 40 years ago, uh, or maybe about uh, maybe more, more than 40 years ago, in the Stairway to Heaven, was making a similar claim. Talk to me about what Sitchin was saying about this cartouche. Okay, um, this was, uh, I think it was, his, uh, you're right, uh, his Stairway to Heaven, which was 1980, so that's what, about 37 years ago, um, Sitchin essentially claimed that the marks that, Colonel Vice claimed to have discovered in these chambers were forgeries. Um, now, this, th this claim only formed a very small and minor part of Sitchin's broader work. Um, Sitchin didn't have access to the kind of um, information that I have access to today, um, or you know, he didn't have the means to, to, to present any of this new evidence that, that I've uncovered recently. But, you know, Sitchin did raised some valid points in his um, 
um, research. The first thing he raised was that Davison's chamber, this is the very first of these relie relieving chambers. That chamber was, had already been opened for about 70 years before Vice went to Egypt. But the, the interesting thing here, Richard, is that when you go into Davison's chamber, there are none of these painted marks anywhere to be found in that chamber. And this chamber, remember, it's a relieving chamber and it's identical to all the other four chambers above it. Okay? No marks were found whatsoever. The only painted marks were found only in the chambers that Vice blasted his way into. Which, and these are the only marks found in any pyramid. You know, you know these, these early old kingdom pyramids, so the, the so, giant pyramids. So these quarry marks, as they're known, uh, you would expect that if, it, if that was standard procedure... Something like a quarry mark, you know, you buy a painting, the artist's name is on it and so forth, or if you buy a piece of pottery, the manufacturer's on the bottom. You would expect yep. if there are quarry marks uh, in the Giza pyramid, you would find quarry marks in different chambers and in, and, and in most other pyramids, but we do not. All right, we'll, um, we'll take a time out, uh, Scott. When we get back, we will uh, dive deep into your evidence that the cartouche discovered by Colonel Weiss, which time stamps... The Pyramid of Giza at 2550 BCE is a forgery, throwing the dating of the pyramid wide open. Back with more of The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. Don't go away. Keeping an eye on the New World Order, this is The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. We are back with Scott Creighton, engineer and also the host of the Alternative Egyptology Forum on AboveTopSecret.com. And his latest is The Great Pyramid Hoax, The Conspiracy to Conceal the History of Ancient Egypt. So, have you been into the King's Chamber? Have you seen the cartouche for yourself, Scott? I've been inside the King's Chamber, Richard, but unfortunately I did not have permission to get into the relieving chambers above the King's Chamber where these marks are. You really, really need a um, real difficult permit to get into these upper chambers, and it's a very, very difficult journey <laughs> through the narrow shaft that Vice made. That's curious. Uh, you would think that, you know, the king's chamber would be sort of the holy of holies, and you would think it would be more difficult to get in there, and yet these relieving chambers where these cartouches are stamped, that is more difficult to gain access to. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm paranoid. It sounds suspicious to me. <laughs> well, no, it's really more, um, when I say difficult, I'm talking more about its physical location within the pyramid. You need a ladder from the bottom of the king's chamber. You need a ladder that's about 25 feet tall, you know, just to get access to Davison's chamber. You know, it's a very precarious journey. Ah. It's quite a dangerous journey. So let's talk about, for you, this cartouche, it's a forgery. Why do you believe that? For a number of reasons, obviously, all, all the evidence is presented in the book. But let me just give you um, one example. Colonel Weiss published his official account, but he also had a private journal, his handwritten field notes of his time when he was at Giza, and he used those field notes to write his final published account of his operations at Giza. The final account was published in 1840, but his field notes are dated to 1837. Now, when you read Colonel Weiss's published account, he tells us consistently throughout it that he desired to make an important discovery. He wanted to find a cartouche specifically that would help date the pyramids. That's in his published account. Now, when you go to look at his private journal, as I did, I managed to track his private journal, his handwritten notes. They're located in a small archive library in the north of London. I found these, and I was reading through them. I managed to find the first chamber that Colonel Weiss entered was Wellington's chamber. This was the first chamber that he managed to blast his way into with gunpowder. Now, when he visited this chamber on two occasions, on the second occasion, he writes in his private notes that there was nothing in the chamber that looked like hieroglyphics. Now, when Vice uses the term hieroglyphics, he's talking about these quarry marks. Right. And um, these are the marks that the gangs would paint their gang name their crew name onto their block that they cut. They took pride in these, so they made sure that their gang name was stamped on these blocks or painted onto these blocks. So Vice tells us there was nothing in this chamber, Wellington's chamber, that looked like that. And then three years later, we find in his published account, 
of the very same night, Richard, the very same night, remember, this guy's wanting to find a cartouche. He writes in his published book, on this night we found the quarry marks. In Wellington's chamber? In Wellington's chamber. The same, same chamber night. that he said he found nothing in earlier? Yes. And his private notes, his private thoughts of his time at Giza, so we know that's authentic, that's his real thoughts, he found nothing. And then in his published book, he says he found the quarry marks. And then when you go and look to see, well, what quarry marks had he found, he got one of his assistants to basically copy the quarry marks that were allegedly painted in these chambers. And when you go and look at the quarry marks from Wellington's chamber, what do you find? A cartouche. And that's the very thing Vice wanted to find. And the remarkable thing is, in his private notes, there's not a single mention of him finding a cartouche. And that was the very thing he wanted to find. Right. There's so no that... eureka moment, nothing, completely silent. And yet he found a cartouche, allegedly. Very suspicious, the... very suspicious. Now, these are painted on in okra, which yes. is a dye derived from vegetables. Uh, well, it, it's, would it be... it's iron oxide. Okay, iron oxide. Okay. Yeah. So would it would it not be possible to carbon date the okra cartouche in Wellington's chamber and elsewhere to see if it if it fits into that 2550 BCE time period? Yeah. Well, this is the thing that I don't know if you recall the two German graduates from a um, university in Germany. I think it was 2013. They took some um, well, illegally took some ochre paint from one of the um, high hieroglyphic signs, hieratic signs um, from Campbell's chamber, not the cartouche, a much less significant um, sign that had been painted onto one of the walls there. They took the ochre paint because sometimes what the ancient Egyptians would do is they would put, add honey or gum or fish oil to because iron oxide, you can't carbon date iron oxide, it's not organic, but the ancient Egyptians would put or an organic binding agent like ah. gum or honey or something like that to, to help bind the ochre paint. Uh, they hoped that they would be able to test the organic material in the ochre paint, but they didn't have sufficient quantity ah. um, to right. have it carbon carbon Drat. Drat. But All right. We, we, I've got to take a quick time out, Scott. We'll come back and okay. we'll uh, discuss further. The Great Pyramid Hoax with Scott Creighton right here on The Conspiracy Show. Question everything. This is The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. We are back with Scott Creighton, engineer and host of the Alternative Egyptology Forum on AboveTopSecret.com. And his latest book is The Great Pyramid Hoax, A Conspiracy to Conceal the True History of Ancient Egypt. Earlier, uh, Scott, we were talking about the uh, the two German lads who uh, snuck into the chamber, I guess, and scraped away some of the iron oxide on the cartouche in hoping... They were hoping to carbon date it, but there wasn't enough binding material, gum or resin or honey, in order to obtain, you know, an accurate carbon dating. So uh, that's a dead end. What else, though, about the cartouche leads you to believe that Vice forged it? You mentioned earlier that in his private notes, in his journal, he wrote when he went into the Wellington chamber, he was looking, hoping to find the cartouche. He didn't find it. And then three years later, when it was published, for public consumption, he claims all of a sudden that he found the cartouche in Wellington's chamber, which is which is suspicious. What else about the cartouche itself? Are there any inconsistencies with any of the symbols, for example? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, right, so what you find, um, particularly in, in right across, there was something like, um, I think it was about six cartouches found in all throughout these, these various chambers. And what you find is when you do an analysis of the actual signs used, because what you have to understand is that hieratic um, writing is just a hieratic script. It's basically just hieroglyphics that are painted as opposed to being carved, okay? Hieroglyphics are carved, hieratic is painted or, or written, okay? Now, what you find is that over time, at the beginning, hieratic script is very much like, you know, the actual hieroglyphics. But over time the hieratic script changed, it evolved, it became ever more simplified for speed of writing. It was basically the everyday writing that the ancient Egyptians would use as this hieratic script. And as I said, over time, it would change, it would vary. And eventually, it would come into what was known as demotic script, which is 
basically bears no resemblance to hieroglyphics whatsoever. So we've got this, this change, and we know roughly when these signs evolved and changed from one into the other into the other. Now what you find when you look at the signs in these cartouches is that many of them are from dynasties that are much later, from the 11th, 12th, or from about the 8th to the 12th dynasties. You know, that's long after the 4th dynasty. So there we have, you know, uh, you know, un unless the ancient Egyptians, you know, had a time machine to get into the future to see what these signs would look like, you know, you know, uh, several hundred years down the road and come back and, you know, it's just, it's just nonsense. Not only that, but, you know, so you've got anachronistic signs being used within the cartouche. You've also got the cartouches being written um, horizontally. Now, the actual text is horizontal, whereas in the Fourth Dynasty, this text would have been written vertically. That's a pretty, so these, glar that's a pretty glaring mistake. Yes, absolutely. This is why I, you know, I see in the book, um, Richard, that the, you know, the authorities must know these are fake. They have to know. They must know because that is so glaring and so obvious. But they say nothing. They say nothing. But they must know. And in fact, I know that they know that they're fake because I've had Egyptologists email me personally. And I can't divulge who these Egyptologists are because, you, know, you know, I wouldn't put their, their careers or their jobs, or their, their, their living in jeopardy, you know. But they have said to me, you're right. We know they're fake. What about Vice's um, team members, those that accompanied him? Uh, did any of his, uh, those that were, were part of his archaeological team, did they, did they write journals? Did they talk about, ab about this? And is there, are there any clues there? Well, what we have is we have um, his two main assistants were a guy called Raven and a guy called Hill. Raven and Hill. <laughs> Great names. Yep. Now, these two guys... Um, uh, are mentioned by another guy called Humphreys Brewer. He was an eyewitness to this forgery, okay? And this guy, Humphreys Brewer, was with um, this team in 1837. He ended up in Giza by accident. He was there to work in a hospital. It fell through, didn't go ahead, and he ended up working with Vice and his team. Now, we know this because this is one of the things that uh, Zechariah Sitchin uh, wrote in his um, Journeys to the Mythical Past, 2007, um, a chap by the name of Walter Allen got in touch with uh, Zechariah and explained this to him that his great-grandfather, um, Humphreys Brewer, had worked with Vice at the pyramids and saw this forgery taking place. So we've got that testimony that's been handed down, and he basically says that Mr. Raven and Mr. Hill were um, repainting some faint marks but also painting new marks. Ah. Aha. Uh -huh. so, That's so pretty have, damning. That's pretty damning stuff. Yeah. So we have, we have an eyewitness as well, you know, from, you know, um, this Humphreys Brewer who saw Raven and Hill. But not only that, in Vice's journal, in his, not in his published book, because he's not going to put this kind of stuff in his published book. This guy Brewer isn't mentioned in his published book because... He basically accused Vice of, you know, um, this forgery. So Vice is not going to be writing about Humphreys Brewer. This is why this guy's name is missing in Vice's published account. But if you look at his private account, I've seen a few examples of what appears to be, remember I said at the top of the programme, his handwriting is really, really difficult to read. But there, there does look like a few examples of the name Brewer being mentioned in his private notes. But in his private notes, he actually writes, he actually writes this for Raven and Hill. You know, um, these are the marks. This is the cartouche that I want um, to be placed in Campbell's chamber. That I want to be placed. That he wants Raven and Hill to place in Campbell's chamber. Well, <laughs> I mean, right there, that's an admission of guilt. It's it's in the guy's diary. Now, it's not in his published book, of course. He's not no, going to put no, that no. in his published book. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that his private journals survived the fire, uh, that they weren't destroyed, um, because that he's basically damned his, you know, it's pretty damning evidence. Yeah, it's damning evidence. But the thing is, 
Um, you know, you hold on to diaries or your personal stuff. You know, in 1837, you know, <laughs> it's like maybe he did plan to get you know rid of it. Maybe he did plan to to burn these pages. Who knows? But maybe he died the day before he did it. You know, <laughs> the the point is the stuff did survive, and um, it is pretty damning evidence um, from his um, private journals. But there's a whole load of other stuff from his private journals, which are which obviously are, are I present in the book, which show that you know this this was a clear a clear hoax, a clear fraud. The Great Pyramid Hoax: The Conspiracy to Conceal the True History of Ancient Egypt. Scott Creighton is with us, an engineer and host of the very popular. Alternative Egyptology Forum on AboveTopSecret.com. Uh, now, I um, uh, several weeks ago I had a, a, a gentleman from um, Nexus Magazine uh, who's a photographer, and he was, you know, this is neither here, it's not related to this topic, but it, I am going someplace, so bear with me. Uh, he wanted to present photographic evidence that he believes proved the lunar landings were a hoax. He said there's no way they could have taken those photos on the moon with a Hasselblad camera under these certain uh, conditions and so forth. Well, he took his case to the Interplanetary Science Association or Council or whatever it's called in London. Is there sort of an equivalent Egyptology type association where you can go and present your, your argument? That's an interesting question. I've, uh, it's not something I've um, considered because it's not something I've ever actually come across. And, you know, I do a lot of research an awful lot of research, and it's it's really not something that um, I've I've come across. I don't think there's a sort of um, um, arbitration service, if you could call it that, for you know matters um, Egyptology. You know, so uh, probably not, Richard. I wouldn't I wouldn't think so. Well, what uh, about I think it's, what about publishing in a peer-reviewed archaeological journal? Again, I think um, that's that's difficult because to do that, you need to be um, you need to be part of a, you know, a university. You need to be attached in some way to a university or or wherever. And you know, my research is purely um, independent. I'm an independent researcher, not um, attached to any official academic body. Um, so I'm very much on the outside. And you know, as I said, I, to be honest, I actually prefer that because it gives me the freedom. Um, to do things and go places where, you know, orthodox people really can't, you know. But the orthodox, think, archaeo the orthodox Egyptologists, the, the, your critics, have they come after you? Have they tried to argue that, uh, are they trying to attempt to find some fault in your, in your theory? Um, well, not yet, because the book's only um, just out, um, uh, came out, uh, I think, the 15th of December, so it's fairly, you know, it's still very new, and um, I'm basically waiting for the backlash, Richard, and it will come. Oh, yes. But, you know, I have the evidence to back up what I'm saying. The book, there's a ton of evidence. I mean, I've only scratched the surface tonight in our discussion here. There's a ton of evidence which shows that, um, you know, I'm talking about a chemical analysis as well, not of the actual paint marks, but the, the, there's other chemical analysis which has been done, which show categorically that those marks are fake. You know, we've got the journal, we've got the eyewitness, we've got, a, you know, that's just, as I said, a few things. Read the book, there's an absolute ton of evidence, anachronistic signs, you know, from the future, you know. It's, it's, it's just a complete mess. And as I said, Egyptology, they must know, and I do know they know, because I've had Egyptologists email me saying, yes, you're right, and we do know. But they're afraid to go public. They don't want to go public because, you know, for them it's a, the way I, the way I describe it, it's a, it's a convenient untruth for them. It helps them maintain the status quo. Well, it that's helps. that's key, the, sta the status quo. Uh, in other words, if something doesn't fit the, the timeline of our, our ancient past, then it has to be discarded. And one, one has to wonder... Uh, given this hoax, and I think you've made uh, as a, a pretty compelling argument. I mean, uh, one could almost say case closed that Vice's um, cartouche is a forgery, and therefore the entire 
uh, historical context of the Great Pyramid is thrown into question. Um, one has to wonder then how much, how much, how many other things in terms of uh, ancient sites and construction dates and the dating of certain civilizations are also thrown open to question. Well, yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. You know, this this places you know, a big, big question. This reopens the case of the Great Pyramid. You know, who built it? Who really built it? And when was it really built? And also, the why? Why was it done? You know, so that this evidence you know, pulls a rug um, from. This is what Graham Hancock said the other day in a, in a tweet. The evidence in this book it just pulls a rug from under the conventional narrative completely away, and you know the house of cards that was built there, you know it just, it just crumbles. But you know you look at people like um, Virginia Steen McIntyre, you know she's been um, arguing for about the last 20 or 30 years about a site in Mexico, you know that they found um, you know uh, tools there. You know, and, and the, the layers of earth that date these tools to 250,000 years ago. But, you know, science, no, that's impossible. That, that just has to be wrong. You know, they're not even accepting their own science. You know, it's crazy. And then I think about 10 years ago, uh, the, they went back to the site and ran the same tests and, and more tests and different tests and got the same result. Yeah, 250,000 years ago, there was people in Mexico. You know, we're not supposed to have crossed the land bridge until, what, about 19,000, 20,000 years ago. You know, so it just, but science, <laughs> when they find something that contradicts the conventional narrative, the conventional chronology timeline, it, they just throw it. They just, well, this is what it people... It just doesn't make it through the knowledge filter. This is what people need to understand about science, all fields of science. It is very, very political. And yeah. obviously... Uh, the field of Egyptology, perhaps more so than many other fields. Scott, congratulations on uh, the Great Pyramid hoax. Keep doing what you're doing, uh, and uh, perhaps in your next book, do you, do you think that maybe you'll you'll uh, uh, start to look into maybe when the Great Pyramid at Giza was constructed and why? Yeah, well, I've actually done that already. <laughs> That's in my previous book, The Secret ah. Chamber of Osiris. All right, now I got to backtrack and read that one. All right, <laughs> Scott, thank you so much for this. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Richard. I've enjoyed our, our chat tonight. Likewise, my friend. Thank you. All right. My website is strangeplanet.ca. That's a landing page. It takes you to all my different projects. Please say hello on Twitter at Richard Serrett. And as always, now more than ever, follow the truth. Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. Thanks for inviting me into your home, your long-haul truck, RV camper, your parents' basement, your loft, that greasy spoon just off the interstate, and your cabin in the woods. 
A big howdy to all of you catching The Conspiracy Show on one of our affiliate stations, the podcast at TalkZone.com. A hi to all of you who take The Conspiracy Show with you on your mobile device. The app is amazing, and it's a free download. However and wherever you're listening, I bid thee the warmest of welcomes, and I thank you for your fine company. Rosemary Ellen Guiley is here. It's uh, that time of the month for our Paranormal News Roundup, and uh, she'll be here for the full hour. Uh, just a reminder, Albert, my story producer, not here tonight to run our live stream on, on YouTube. So again, no live stream on YouTube this week, but he'll be back next week along with our What's in the Box feature. Uh, Tom Warzeka and I believe uh, Derek Rassman, both of them, from Kohilo uh, Wind Turbines uh, will be here to discuss their disruptive turbine technology. Uh, that's next week on The Conspiracy Show. Oh, and one more thing. I tweeted this out last week at Richard Serrett, at Richard Serrett. Send me your questions. Use the hashtag AMA Richard Serrett. AMA, ask me anything, Richard Serrett, S-Y-R-E-T-T. AMA Richard, uh, AMA Richard Sarah, and I'll answer your questions and post the video to YouTube next week. So again, use the hashtag AMA Richard Serrett, and uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. We've uh, set a target of 10,000 subs before the end of the year. That's not a lot, uh, really, but uh, I'm hoping you can help me put that over the top fairly quickly. Rosemary Ellen Guiley is an American writer on topics related to spirituality, the occult, and the paranormal. She's also a radio show host, a certified hypnotist, a board director of the National Museum of Mysteries and Research, uh, and the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters, and a Lifetime Achievement Award winner from the Upper Peninsula a Paranormal Research Society, Michigan. She's written more than 60 Six zero, that is, 60 books, including major encyclopedic works. Rosemary Ellen Guiley, welcome back to The Conspiracy Show. How are you? I'm doing well, Richard. It's always a pleasure to be back with you. I've been out in California for a few weeks, uh, down to Australia to talk at conferences. Um, it's been an exciting time here this winter, and I'm very glad to be missing the snow back in Connecticut. <laughs> I know, Hawaii, now you're on the West Coast. I would love to have your frequent flyer points. <laughs> they do come in handy <laughs> yes. for a great trip. You rack them up, that's for sure. How was Australia, by the way? Any in interesting uh, investigations down under? I didn't get a chance to do investigations, but I did speak at two conferences back-to-back. -back. One was an afterlife conference. Uh, on survival and death and dying, and the other was uh, a UFO conference called Close Encounters. And what I really liked about the second conference was that it devoted a great deal of attention to the experiencer end of things. Mm. Uh, in, in America, we have um, so much emphasis on old cases, nuts and bolts, um, conspiracy, uh, things that we we seem to go round and around on uh, when actually some of the most exciting developments are in the experiencer end of things. People are having contact experiences and how that's changing them. And uh, so it's refreshing to be at a conference where the focus was on the experiencer rather than on, um, you know, some case from the 1960s that's been talked about you know, over and over right. again. Right, yeah, you're right. Uh, I've noticed that with, uh, you know, the various UFO um, conferences. It's it's Roswell uh, um, and maybe, you know, Rendlesham Forest and so forth. And and uh, But I think it's changing. I think we're starting to see some changes here. I think people are we're talking more about abductees and, and, and things like that. Um, you know, the, the work that I've been doing with FREE, the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters, that has put a spotlight on the experiencer, too. And so as that data starts to filter into the UFO community, um, I'm, it's my personal hope that, that that will shift some interest into exploring more of those areas. Mm -hmm, indeed. Uh, I want to talk to you about a, uh, something you and I have talked about on the air before. We've dedicated whole shows to this, and that is uh, the phenomenon known as the doppelganger. But there's one aspect of, because there are different types of doppelgangers. Uh, I know you had a, um, an astral projection uh, experience where you, you, you left the living room, went into the kitchen, you came back into the living room and found yourself asleep on the couch, and you couldn't get back into your body. That's one type. 
but it was freaky. Yeah, there, but there's another type that has to do, and this often involves uh, sort of spiritually enlightened people. It's very prevalent in the history of the Catholic Church, Buddhist monks, for example, as well. And that has to do with bilocation. Tell me, tell me about that. Bilocation is where a person has the ability to be in two places at once, doing separate things. And people in both of those locations are convinced that they're dealing with the real person. Uh, The individual who is bilocating has has the capability of carrying on conversations, doing physical things, having physical contact with people, and seeming to be uh, flesh and blood. And it does have a relationship to uh, what I would call a cousin phenomenon, the doppelganger, uh, which is a projection of your double. And sometimes it's hard to know where the lines sh- can be drawn because in a lot of cases of, of the doppelgangers, um, this seems to be a double of a person that sometimes has an apparitional look or feel to it. It's very close to the individual, um, the, the living individual, and it doesn't have um, a, a lot of times the full capability of conversation and in interacting. Um, and in these cases where uh, the person does, um, we find a lot of these cases in the saint literature and in the uh, esoteric literature. Uh, these are powers um, that are well known in yoga, for example, the ability to bilocate. And it seems that as human beings spiritualize their consciousness, they can acquire these superpowers, and bilocation is one of them. Uh, Did you broach uh, bilocation in any of your encyclopedias on uh, the saints? Because this ability has been attributed to a number of uh, saints from as early as the 13th century. There was St. Anthony of Padua, also known as the the wonder worker. Uh, Is this an area that you've covered in your, your work on saints? In the Encyclopedia of Saints, yes, I go into it quite a bit. And, in fact, uh, we find bilocation to be such a common ability among the saints that it's almost considered to be one of, one of the prerequisites, prerequisites for sainthood. Uh, and I think this has to do, again, with the evolution of spiritual consciousness. Uh, the uh, literature of the saints has many examples of this. And um, one of the most recent, in fact... Um, in modern day, is uh, Padre Pio. And he was recently canonized in, uh, I think it was 2001. And uh, he was very well known for his ability to bilocate, where he could be, uh, for example, uh, praying or uh, doing something in a, a church or a monastery or with other people, and in a distant location, be doing something else, ministering to people who are in need, uh, people who are sick. And that seems to be um, one of the factors involved with the Western saints, that there's some sort of need that calls them out. Now, uh, in yoga, this is a power called, it's one of the cities, and it's related to the um, evolution of the kundalini energy in people, which is a psycho-spiritual energy that as you advance uh, in on your spiritual path, this energy becomes more prominent throughout the body. It rises up the spinal cord, and it activates the chakra points. Uh, and as you become more spiritualized, then you acquire bilocation, clairvoyance, telepathy, uh, rapid transport or teleportation, the ability to manifest a port, uh, the ability to be invisible, Uh, things that uh, people think would be quite wonderful uh, to be able to do. But in enlightenment, uh, they're almost considered to be impediments to enlightenment because they can gratify the ego. And, um, of course, when uh, we see these uh, uh, powers expressed in the Western saints, they have spent uh, their lifetimes devoted to spiritual practice, intense meditation, intense prayer, uh, devotion, uh, purifying themselves, and so these abilities then begin to manifest. And the true challenge is then to be able to use them uh, for the greater good rather than for selfish purpose. And how uh, how does this bilocation take place? Is it in fact a, um, 
a deliberate astral projection? It's very deliberate in cases with intensely spiritualized people. And Sai Baba, for example, is another modern example of that in the, on the eastern side of things, um, that uh, you can do this at will. And you perceive a need in a distant location or you feel yourself being called. And this was the case with Padre Pio, is that he would feel himself called out by his, by people who were devoted to him and praying intensely to him for some kind of help. Uh, and they have the ability then to literally be in two places at once. Um, and sometimes uh, it's a case of uh, they carry on as usual uh, in their uh, initial location and activity. Uh, nothing seems to be remiss. Or they may fall into a heavy trance. And uh, St. Martin de Porras was an example of that where he would go into deep trances uh, when he would be called out, uh, and so he would be almost inactive in one state and very active in the other. Um, whereas uh, in some cases, like Padre Pio, uh, there seemed to be no difference in the ability of the individual to be active in two locations at once. Hmm. So that's a little different from the doppelganger, right. where uh, people find themselves uh, spontaneously projecting um, a kind of ghostly double of themselves, and right. they may not even be aware of it. And that's what happened to you. Uh, we've talked about that before. Listen, uh, we've got to take a time out. I just wanted to throw in here, uh, because we've been talking about you know mystical people, spiritual people that can bilocate. There was actually a case uh, where I, but I, I happened, to, I think that this was more a case of sort of myth building, and that had to do with um, former uh, Soviet leader Vladimir Lenin back in the 20s, who was said to have bilocated uh, he was seen by Kremlin guards uh, walking al along, around the palace all alone, even though he had been months earlier totally incapacitated by a series of strokes. And, of course, this was corroborated by other witnesses, but uh, certainly nothing spiritual about Vladimir Lenin. I'm thinking maybe this was just a case of them trying to build up his uh, his legend. Uh, we'll, we'll take a time out, and when we come back, Rosemary, I want to talk to you about something very strange going on the Philippine, in, in the Philippines at karaoke bars uh, that involves the uh, the Frank Sinatra classic My Way uh, and a series of murders. We'll uh, do that and much more. Rosemary Allen Guiley, right here on The Conspiracy Show. Stay with us. The owners of the system are asleep. Now we can play. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. And we are back with Rosemary Ellen Guiley, the author of over 60 books involving the paranormal, supernatural, and uh, her website is visionaryliving.com, visionaryliving.com. Check out her online bookstore, and you can peruse, as I say, over 60 titles. Very prolific. Uh, Rosemary, this is a strange one. Uh, Frank Sinatra, one of my favorite artists, I, I saw him in concert three times, and uh, his song, My Way, which was written by a, Can a Canadian, uh, the great Paul Anka, uh, there's this strange thing going on in the Philippines where this song, when it's sung in karaoke bars, has spawned a, a bunch of murders. Um, it's become this cultural ph phenomenon where it's called the My Way killings. What do you know about this? It's happened too often to be just a fluke. And we've, we've had um, other examples in the past of, uh, people claiming that the influence of certain bands, songs, or lyrics um, can influence people to do drastic things, even commit suicide, murder, um, go on rampages. And um, one wouldn't expect that, however, out of a Frank Sinatra song. This is, these are usually acquisition, uh, accusations that get leveled against rock bands. Sure, like Judas Priest. They were actually taken to court because some of their lyrics supposedly uh, influenced someone to, to commit suicide. And then, of course, there was Charlie Manson talking about Helter Skelter and how that uh, he, he believed there were se he, secret messages in there just for him. And Led Zeppelin has been accused of the same. We had uh, the Blue Oyster Cult, uh, who was accused of co uh, encouraging young people to commit suicide by trying to make it sound glamorous. But, but here's a song of, of, that was sung by Frank Sinatra, and uh, it's about 
um, sort of uh, doing your own thing and following your own course and um, regardless of uh, other influences. And people have speculated that, uh, you know, why? Why would this song uh, make individuals go berserk and especially murder people who are singing this song? Right. Twelve and times it's happened. Twelve murders in these well, karaoke bars. Well, you know, the argument's been made that maybe these people were singing it badly and other people got upset, but uh, that's almost a joke that you can't take seriously. So I think we have to look at the lyrics of the song, and is there something in the lyrics of the song that maybe trigger people who are in the right psychological state? And the, st the song starts out about uh, the end is near and facing the final curtain, and uh, so it's about living a life that's full, uh, and no matter what came along, I did things my way. Uh, in other words, everybody else sort of be damned. Um, I, I did what I wanted. Um, I had my own vision. Right. Regrets. And, I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. And could that trigger something? Uh, let's mm -hmm. say if someone had repressed anger or they were depressed and they're in a bar and they're drinking, could that trigger uh, something uh, for them to act out some sort of internal rage? Interesting. Well, uh, it's only, as far as I know, happening in these karaoke bars. And karaoke is very popular, a very popular form of entertainment uh, in the Asian community, particularly in the Philippines, in Chinese communities, Japanese communities in, in North America. Karaoke is huge. Um, and in one case, Rosemary, it was the security guard at the karaoke bar who shot the singer. So there's no logical explanation for what's going on here. Uh, and my personal feeling is I, I have to go back on, it must be something in the lyrics that in the right circumstances... Um, triggers something in, in individuals. Uh, although, why this would only happen in karaoke bars and not, for example, night, just general nightclubs? I guess this is a very popular song. Uh, and unless it really does get down to how somebody is, is, um, you know, portraying this music. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, I wonder if it's possible that, uh, you know, people talked about how there were certain triggers in the Catcher in the Rye book, uh, in that Mel Gibson movie, Conspiracy Theory, uh, Mel Gibson, who became this unwitting assassin, uh, was reading Catcher in the Rye. Mark David Chapman, who killed John Lennon, immediately after doing the deed, he sat down on the curb uh, outside the Dakota and was thumbing through his copy of Catcher in the Rye. Do you, do you suppose it's possible that someone has, I don't know, these shooters were somehow... Uh, hypnotized, and they were. T there's there are trigger words in the song now that that caused them to do this. It's an argument that's been made by critics of a lot of kinds of music that there are subliminal triggers in lyrics, and uh, especially lyrics combined with sound that uh, can activate certain things in certain individuals, and. I, I can't for the life of me think that this music, uh, these lyrics were composed with that in mind. Um, and is this an accidental sort of programming? It doesn't seem to occur in other cultures. Hmm. And, uh, you know, yes, it's true. You know, I've been to Japan and I know how popular those karaoke bars uh, are. And um, uh, there is a cultural difference there. But we don't find people at concerts or nightclubs where this popular song is is being sung over and over again doing the same thing. No, I mean... something it, exactly. peculiar to that environment. It's true. Uh, in fact, uh, President Trump and um, uh, Melania, that was their first dance at the inaugural ball. They danced uh, to to my way. Well, uh, it's gotten so bad that they're banning the song in, in a number of karaoke bars. So I guess if you find yourself in Manila and you have an urge to go and get up on stage and sing karaoke... A safe bet would be Bette Midler's The Rose. Well, definitely this sh this song should be avoided. Absolutely. Uh, now, this is um, a fascinating story. Uh, it's called The Island in the Clouds, and um, it's called Mount Rory Roraima. I guess it's this huge plateau in the rainforest of Venezuela, 
or a series of plateaus, and they rise more than 9,000 feet off the ground. And uh, from above, if you're flying over them, they, look, they literally look like islands in the sky. And uh, these Venezuelan plateaus, some have, su- has, have suggested that they could be the home to a lost world where dinosaurs exist. Maybe they were the inspiration for H.G. Wells' Lost World. Uh, I had never heard of the, this place before. What do you know? They're definitely spooky, and yes, uh, from the air, they do look like islands in the sky because the cloud cover is often just below the top of these uh, plateaus, obscuring the world below, making them look like they're floating in the sky. Now, uh, they've been explored for hundreds of years, a little bit. They, uh, they were first mentioned by Sir Walter Raleigh in 1595. Um, he was aware of them. Uh, the the natives of Venezuela uh, have been able to penetrate them, but Westerners, not so much. Most of them remain totally unexplored. And uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was fascinated by um, early accounts of uh, ascents to these plateaus for exploration. And that's what really inspired his novel, The Lost World. Right. It was, I, said H. G. These- I said H.G. Wells. You're right. It's Arthur Conan Doyle, of course. Uh, and dinosaurs and, um, you know, this prehistoric world that exists. Well, I think that uh, these plateaus are probably home to a lot of supernatural, spooky things. And, yes, they are home to um, very unique species because they've been isolated from the rest of the world. So uh, researchers are finding species of plants and animals and um, bird life, that are unknown elsewhere. But according to what we know about them, uh, they were formed a little after the dinosaur era. So it's unlikely that uh, dinosaur bones are going to be found there. Uh, I think they missed the mark by about um, 5 to 50 million years, depending upon estimates as to uh, when dinosaurs first started appearing on the planet, they, uh, if they were formed prior to the dinosaurs, they would have been so high up in elevation uh, that they already would have been isolated from that. But nonetheless, something that's been so isolated like that would, uh, to me, be full of something so primeval, um, so raw, that um, supernatural experiences there I think would be very intense. And would this literally be a land of the gods? I think so. That's definitely a, a place I'd like to visit. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you'd have to travel with an oxygen mask. That's It's so high up. But uh, imagine... 9,000 feet. I, yeah, I had no idea that this place even existed. We've got a few minutes here. We're going to head into a break shortly. I want to start uh, talking about these... Uh, phone booths in Japan, and this is going to lead into a conversation we'll have in the next half hour. But after the earthquake and tsunami tore through Japan back in 2011, something like 16,000 people died. And during the natural disaster, uh, many communities, you know, still haven't haven't recovered. But one coastal Japanese town is dealing with its grief in a unique way: a white telephone booth with glass panels. The phone booth, which only has a disconnected rotary phone inside. A disconnected rotary phone has become a popular destination for residents who are still dealing with grief. And, uh, Rosemary, what can you tell me about this phone booth to the dead? This is an absolutely wonderful idea, and uh, I'm sure it's helped many, many people. But here's this uh, phone booth, which actually was put up before the tsunami. and it was, it was resurrected, a white phone booth with a disconnected rotary phone in it. It was uh, put up before the tsunami by uh, a man who wanted some sort of way to try and communicate with um, his his own dead family members. It was a way of processing his own grief. And after the tsunami, it became a focal point for um, many other people who had uh, lost uh, so much in that tsunami. As you mentioned, 16,000 people died that they could come into this phone booth and pick up the receiver and ask to have a conversation with lost loved ones. And um, 
this is, uh, um, well, it's a symbolic way of processing your grief. It gives you something to do. Um, I imagine that people are quite overcome with emotion uh, when they are in this booth feeling like they might be able to talk to the dead. But the question that I have is what paranormal conversations really do take place? Because I'll bet you there are quite a few people who go through this experience and have some sort of message from the dead, whether they get it internally, like through clairvoyance or an inner knowing, or an actual voice that they think that they're hearing. Um, people may be able to have that experience as a result of uh, so much, um, you know, collected emotional energy going into this process. Well, I know you have documented uh, cases where people have, and, and I've, I've, I've done open line uh, phone-in shows on this as well, and people called in and, and talked about experiences where a phone has literally rung when they picked it up, uh, they heard this crackly, crackling on the other end, and they heard the voice of a deceased loved one. Uh, we'll talk about that when we come back. That'll be the focus of our next half hour. Rosemary Ellen Guiley, Telephone Conversations with the Dead. Stay with us right here, The Conspiracy Show. The truth is not out there. It's right here. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. We are back with Rosemary Ellen Guiley, the author of over 60 books, and uh, the website is visionaryliving.com. She joins us once a month for our Paranormal News Roundup. Before the break, we were talking about this phone booth in Japan that overlooks the Pacific Ocean. Back in 2011, a horrific earthquake and tsunami killed 16,000 people, uh, which ended up being about, I think, 10% of the town's population. This is Atsuchi. So, sort of as a symbolic gesture, they put this phone booth there containing a, a disconnected rotary phone. So, those who had lost loved ones could go into the phone booth and sort of dial their dead relative or dead friend's phone number and, I guess, imagine a conversation that they would have liked to have had with this person. But as we mentioned, you have actually documented cases where people have claimed to have received telephone calls from the great beyond. Now, was this covered off in the book you co-authored with George Norrie, Conversations with the Dead? Yes, we did have a chapter on phone calls from the dead, and they go on all the time. This has been a well-documented phenomenon. One of the earliest books that went into quite a bit of research on this was called, literally called Phone Calls from the Dead, and it was written by the late D. Scott Rogo and Raymond Bayless, two well-known paranormal investigators. This is research that many people like myself have continued. Now that we have cell phones, it happens over cell phones as well as regular telephones. And there are different patterns to this sort of experience. Usually the living person is the recipient of the call. And that's a little different from the um, Japanese phone where the living are making the call to the other side. But there do seem to be certain circumstances where people can have literally a phone call conversation with someone who has passed on from the other side. And the voice is often a little hard to understand. There's a lot of static on the line. The conversations are very short. Someone may call just to say, hi, I'm okay. Don't worry about me. Some of the calls are anniversary calls, like wedding anniversaries, birthdays, anniversary of a death. And there are some cases where phone calls have been made from the dead to the living where the living person didn't know that the other person had died yet. And uh, that's quite interesting because it becomes a farewell conversation. Now, in uh, talking to the dead, George Norrie and I go into a lot of commentary and speculation on what if we really could develop a phone that would reach into the afterlife. Personally, I believe that that technology will happen someday, that we will have a device that we will be able to use to specifically reach uh, a particular person on the other side. In, in the case of the Japanese phone, people seem to use it for grief processing. And uh, so they pick up a phone and it's the act of, Simulating a conversation with someone, maybe they pour out their grief, um, they hope that that person is all right, um, but I'm betting you that some people hear something back. Well, 
One of the things that I heard when I did an open line segment on this, and you were probably uh, my guest that night on, on the program, people will receive a phone call, and this was in the, in the age of a caller ID, and they would see they would they would see a number on the on the caller ID panel, uh, but it would be just kind of a mishmash of numbers and symbols. It didn't make any sense. Uh, and then, as you say, when they pick up, they hear this crackling and a distant voice. Um, in your experience, in your investigations, were these most often one-way conversations where the deceased would say a few words and hang up, or were there were there cases? Are there cases where a, a prolonged two-way conversation was happening. They were definitely two-way conversations. Um, they're they're usually brief, and um, the person who is deceased will usually have a message that they want to get across, and they're very similar in that way to dream visits from the dead, where there's a compelling reason for uh, the dead person to reach the living person. Uh, but in these phone call uh, cases, uh, there have been um, cases on record where people have carried on conversations for uh, quite a while. Now, the longer ones are usually cases where the living person does not know that the other person has, uh, has died. Uh, when the phone call comes uh, and the, the person, the living person, the recipient knows that they're listening to the voice of someone who's passed over. Uh, there's an initial shock and surprise, uh, and uh, the exchange usually is very short. And then the voice fades away or the call ends. There have even been some interesting cases where um, some unknown operator, remember the days of long-distance operators? Oh, yes. Um, uh, some operator comes on and says the call has to be ended. Oh, okay. Let's, I got to jump in here. We're going to take a time out. We'll come back, and uh, we'll pick up on this telephone calls from the dead. Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and then uh, we'll get into George Van Tassel's Integratron, uh, this sort of time machine built in the uh, Mojave Desert. I know Rosemary was just there. We'll uh, we'll get an update on that as well. Back with more here on the Conspiracy Show. Stay with us. Fasten your seatbelt and put your tray in the upright position. You're about to leave everything you know behind on The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett. We are back with Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and we're talking about telephone conversations with the dead. Uh, Have there been cases where um, someone has received a voicemail message from a deceased person? Yes, there have been. And uh, and, uh, now that we all are on cell phones, a lot of these cases do involve cell phones. There have been some cases, and uh, George and I have one of them in Talking to the Dead, where a man who was killed in a train accident uh, left a, voice, uh, a voicemail on someone's phone, and, uh, you know, these things are time-stamped. Uh, and it was determined that this man already had to have been dead when the voicemail uh, was left. So uh, this phenomenon does con- it, it, it seems to adapt itself to the technology. I think that we will, as, as I was saying a little earlier, we will have the technology that will be able to dial up the other side on demand someday and uh, be able to to maintain maintain our contact. Now, in, in Buddhist communities, maintaining a relationship with the dead is very important. And so they're naturally oriented toward ways that uh, continue to foster communication. And um, many people, for example, um, especially in Japan, they have home altars or shrines where um, the names of uh, dead family members and ancestors are inscribed, and they're considered to be literally homes for the ancestors. So... um, the telephone to the dead, uh, I think, is a, a, a novel addition to that. Uh, and uh, f- frankly, I would like to see more of this. I think it would be a great therapeutic tool. Sure. It, it's well, like, uh, you know, using black mirrors to contact the dead. If you have like a necromantium or psychomantium situation where somebody was in a darkened room with a phone that um, supposedly connected to the other side, 
and you picked it up and started talking, um, you would probably have some profound experiences. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, that we'll have this technology um, one day. And wasn't this uh, a device that both Edison and Tesla, they were, they were rivals, of course. One developed AC current, the other DC. Uh, but they were both working on a telephone uh, that could communicate with the afterlife, were they not? Well, Edison certainly expressed an interest in that, and just how far he got on it, nobody really knows. Uh, he made numerous comments that uh, there technically could and should be such a device, uh, and some people feel that he was actually at work on such a device, but no plans have ever surfaced. Now, he was a meticulous uh, note maker. He scribbled notes and ideas on all kinds of things. He kept uh, lots of diaries. And, of course, the conspiracy theory is that um, after he died, uh, the plans for this alleged device were stolen um, and, uh, you know, never to surface again. It's really kind of up in the air whether or not he actually pursued uh, actual work on such a device as opposed to just talking about it theoretically. But he was interested. Hmm. Um, just one sort of final footnote, and then I want to move on to the Integratron. One of my favorite uh, uh, writers is Dean Kuntz. And uh, Kuntz had um, um, uh, an, an incident where he received a call. Uh, now, his phone number was uh, unlisted, so it, would, it couldn't have been a prank call addressed uh, directed at him, but he received a call from someone who sounded very much like his mother, warning him to be careful. That was all she said. She said it three times, hung up. Uh, and um, then, long story short, he was involved in an altercation, went to visit his father at an old folks' home. His father was suffering from dementia, was walking around the old folks' home with a knife, and uh, Dean got the knife away from him, walked out of his father's room. There were the police uh, with their guns drawn, pointed at him, telling him to drop the knife. And he said, it's not me you want. This is my father's, and I just got it away from him. But he, he said that was one of the worst moments of his life. And then he immediately thought back to that phone call that he had had maybe an hour earlier from a woman uh, who sounded like his mother uh, who had died two decades earlier. So there you go. It, it's more common than than people think. Um, I want to talk to you about you're out there on the West Coast, and I think you're... Um, uh, you've just recently returned, like today, you were in the Mojave Desert, and uh, you visited uh, some place. You've been there before. It's called the Integratron. It was uh, built by George Van Tassel, who was an alleged UFO contactee. Uh, when when did this happen? He built this in the 1950s, something like that, the 60s? Uh, he, he got the ideas for it from extraterrestrials in the 1950s. He was one of the uh, what we would call the Space Brother contactees. Uh, post World War II, and uh, he was um, uh, he moved his family in, into a subterranean um, chamber at a place called Giant Rock, which is one of the world's largest freestanding boulders, and began having uh, contact with aliens. And uh, they would come and visit him in their spacecraft. He started having conferences. Thousands of people would attend. And one night, he was awakened by aliens who who landed near his um, home there at Giant Rock, they said they were from Venus, and they gave him plans for what they said was a time travel slash cellular rejuvenation machine, uh, something that would extend human life by 20 to 50 years and also could be used for time travel. And uh, he was a smart guy. He was uh, an engineer. He worked for uh, Howard Hughes. He worked for, um, I think it was uh, Martin Marietta. Um, and uh, he, he was a very bright man. And uh, so he worked on this for a long time and finally constructed this, um, this structure that looks like a small observatory. It's domed. There isn't a single nail in it. Uh, it's acoustically perfect, and uh, just before it was ready to go online, so to speak, um, and he was traveling around uh, America doing a lot of lecturing, uh, he mysteriously died, uh, supposedly of a heart attack while he was on tour. And immediately after his death, federal agents came to his home in Giant Rock. 
They took all of his papers, his equipment, um, and no one's ever seen it again. Hmm. So whatever time travel aspects the Integratron had uh, have been lost, and exactly how it was supposed to rejuvenate bodies at the cellular level, nobody really knows. But you've but been there. You've not. been there a couple times, and you were there today, in fact. I was there today. Yes, I've been there about a half a dozen times now, and um, it's uh, um, it's used for healing. Um, you go and you take a sound bath there. And the sound bath is provided by crystal bowls. Someone plays uh, this, a full set of crystal bowls to activate the entire chakra system. And the idea is that the sound waves of this pure energy in this acoustically perfect chamber uh, benefit uh, you physically and also spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, and mentally. And it is a profound experience. I did have an out-of-body experience there. Um, and um, I've had uh, a lot of visions. Um, things seem to be clarified there. Like hmm. if uh, you feel like you're blocked or you're struggling with something, uh, you come out of it feeling very clarified. And uh, that's why every time we come out here to the desert, I always go there because I believe it is important to be washed by this sound. Tell me about your out-of-body experience there. Um, th this happened the first time I did the Integratron, and um, while I was, uh, you, you lay down on kind of a futon uh, in this chamber, and um, you can close your eyes or keep them open, and uh, I had my eyes closed, and my husband was next to me, and um uh, I've tried uh, doing uh, directed meditations or just letting the sound go through me, and I think that's the best. And so I was just letting the sound go through me and being carried by the sound, and uh, I felt myself kind of literally going out into space, out into the cosmos. And uh, I didn't open my eyes. Um, it was difficult for me to tell where... Um, whether I was like just having a, a, a visionary projection or I was literally projected out, but my husband had his eyes open and he said that um, I started to get up. Now, I did not. I was prone the entire time. And he saw apparently a double of me get up out of my body. Um, so that was evidence to me that I literally had an out-of-body projection while I was out sort of caterwauling among the stars. <laughs> caterwauling. <laughs> <laughs> is the Integratron, who is it run by? Is it run by the Van Tassel family or is it, part, is it, is it within Joshua National Park? It's very near to uh, Joshua Tree National Park. It's in a tiny little place called Landers. It's about 20 minutes from the park per se. And it's owned by three sisters now, and they had connections to the family. And in fact, their connections to the Integratron go back about 30 or so years. And they purchased it from family members uh, who didn't want to keep it anymore. It was too much of a financial burden for them. And they took it over uh, because they wanted it preserved. They did not want to see it go to, to ruin. And so they've not only kept it going, but now it's thriving because um, uh, people come from all over the world to have the Integratron experience. And uh, they have film crews coming there all the time. They have one coming next week. Um, they're, they're very gracious to researchers, and um, they have uh, a lot of papers there, and um, I'm able to go and do some research there myself. I'm very fascinated by uh, this structure and, and by the life of George Van Tassel and his experiences. Well, tell me a little bit more about Van Tassel. Do you think he was on the up and up? Do you, do you think he was visited by people from Venus? I do. Uh, his his uh, personal story uh, to some uh, seems very outlandish. And when you uh, take into consideration uh, some of the other stories from the Space Brother days that were a little more fantastic, um, I could see how people might question it. But uh, Van Tassel was a solid guy, and uh, he had a scientific engineering background. He certainly had an interest in these things. And uh, he became interested in, in giant rock 
um, because he uh, he he met the man who lived there. There was a a fellow named uh, Frank, and I've forgotten Frank's last name, um, who was kind of a hermit, and he hollowed out uh, this subterranean chapter underneath this boulder and uh, turned it into his home. And uh, Van Tassel became acquainted with him because his car needed repair. Uh, and um, this fellow, uh, he wound up being, Frank wound up being accused of being um, a spy during World War II, um, apparently had a, a German background, and um, federal agents came to raid him. He stored dynamite uh, there, and there was an explosion. Who knows how that happened, and Frank was killed. And uh, after um, after that, then Van Tassel, that's when he moved his family, and he started having these experiences out there in the desert. Well, the Joshua Tree area, uh, is renowned for um, craft in the sky sightings, uh, contact with mysterious beings of all kinds. It has quite a history to it. Well, that's for sure. But Hence the uh, the contact in the desert uh, big conference there every year. Rosemary, I, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm out of time. We have to revisit the Integratron on another occasion. Always a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you. Rosemary Ellen Guiley, VisionaryLiving.com. All right. Don't be afraid. There's nothing concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What you hear in the dark, speak in the light. What I say in a whisper, proclaim from the housetops. Move over, Aphrodite. I'm coming home. Good night.